we begin part two with some of the first uh, looks at the landscape of New Mexico uh, that Georgia O'Keeffe found herself uh, submersed in. And, and uh, if, if you've uh, never been to this part of the world. The landscape itself has a very, very kind of humanistic quality to it. Uh, so when you look at it, oftentimes you'll see people lying on their side, that type of thing. But uh, the crags and, and the, the milks and milks and crannies, if you will, uh, are very organic in a similar way to her flowers. We see her continuing with, with the flower subject matter something that she kind of follows uh, throughout her life, but it, it does change, and, and uh, this is something that, that kind of has to be observed. Uh, we have flowers that are more regional in, in nature, but also how she's painting the flowers and how she's approaching the subject matter, uh, particularly looking on the left, Jimson Weed, 1932, when we have these leaves as part of the composition uh, pointing out in three corners, and then we also have things uh, along this line where, again, the, the flower is the main part of the subject matter, but the, the leaves behind it are, are creating kind of a counterbalance to this large open volume that she has uh, in the center, and as I mentioned before, uh, it, it's really amazing as an artist myself her use of white and and how she's able to create you know a painting like this where you have this huge white space in the middle of the canvas, but uh, it, it's justified. Here we kind of have a composite <clears throat> of a lot of the different. Uh, Jimson Weed paintings into one Jimson Weed three, but a little bit more of a lively character and more a little bit more uh, uh, the, the 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 painting itself has a little bit more of a solidness to it as opposed to the uh, images we saw in the previous paintings of the same flower. This is always a fun version too. It's almost as if she figured out three different ways to paint the flower and then. Uh, uh, that was the composition. Uh, Jim Sidney, Jimson Weed Number no. 1 from 1932 sold for $44.4 million in 2014. Uh, here it is. And again, uh, uh, it's a tribute to how incredible of an artist she is, uh, but also just how renowned she is in terms of American art. And, and this is another beautiful example where when you look at it, you, you, you see these wonderful little hooks on the end of the flower, something you don't immediately notice. Uh, we also see combinations of, of, of things. Uh, her, her basic three elements that we see are the flowers and the skulls and then the landscape. So, uh, you know, Ram's Head, White, Holly, Hawk, Hills uh, is kind of a combination of all of these elements together. And a lot of this is, is this wonderful comparison that we have uh, between the fluidity of these organic textures. And and uh, if, if you live in this part of the world, something that you'll, you'll always notice is the sky. So in addition to uh, uh, the, the, the three elements we've mentioned before, we will Will also include uh, the sky as one of her key key elements, and as we kind of continue along with her work, it becomes more and more of a factor. Uh, again, this continuation of these wonderful skull paintings that she does, and uh, the one on the right with pink poinsettias, it's it's almost difficult to gauge uh, how large that skull is in proximity with the landscape. This is uh, Pradernal. It's it's actually called Cerro Pradernal, uh, but the locals uh, uh, from this area just kind of refer to it as the Pradernal. And this is a major uh, piece of major piece of landscape that's very apparent uh, from you know all around. And and again, if you as I mentioned, if you live in this type of landscape, the the landscape itself becomes a, almost a character. And I'm sure this is true of any larger mountain when you live in proximity with it and you can see the, the pedernal off there in the distance uh, it does become a, a key aspect of of almost uh, daily life uh, again these wonderful combinations of, of using these flowers uh, in perspective with the landscape and these deep deep reds that you would actually uh, be able to see if, if you go down to New Mexico and, and, and see the desert that's out there Again, it should be uh, noted that, that Georgia O'Keeffe would, would go out into the terrain itself 
uh, in order to paint these things that this is uh, not just purely a product of her studio that she uh, very famously would have an old Ford that she would drive out uh, and essentially paint as much as she could during the day and then when it got uh, too warm to be outside she would go inside of her vehicle and then uh, when it got too warm inside of her vehicle she would actually uh, go go home from my understanding but again uh, just connecting uh, a lot of organic material together 1938 she actually has a sponsored trip uh, to Hawaii and this is always this funny story of the pineapple bud painting that I believe she actually painted when she went back uh, to her studio uh, in America, this is something that she didn't actually paint, but uh, she, I believe it's the, uh, what we, we refer today as the, the Dole Pineapple Company today, uh, uh, essentially sponsored this trip, and, and this is not uncommon for the time period of uh, companies kind of sponsoring artists to go and do work uh, as advertising. So uh, from this little period, we actually see some images from Hawaii itself, and, and these are kind of fascinating, uh, if nothing else, because they're they're different from the normal vocabulary that we're used to associating with uh, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. Again, things like this fishing line uh, that, that's kind of unique uh, from my understanding and, and when you look at her work, but again, uh, a lot of her, her work is still going to be centered around these flowers, but uh, what we'll notice, again, we have hibiscus and, and plumera and, and cup of silver ginger. These are, uh, again, uh, from, from, from what I know, uh, these are going to be native to the area rather than what you would naturally find in, in a place like Arizona. So, And you'll also notice it's the sky in the background and the vibrancy of the colors that you would kind of associate uh, with Hawaii and, and kind of the tropics. So uh, in some ways it's, it's very regional what she's actually painting. Uh, an orchid from 1941, a beautiful painting because she's just mastered that, that, that frilly fringe that's on uh, uh, the outside of the orchid itself and these petals that seem to shoot off uh, as if we I've said this uh, many times it's as if you've turned into a an insect and you're flying into the center of one of these wonderful flowers it's also important as we look at uh, these images that we remind ourselves of the day that this is uh, 1941 and that we are getting into the period of World War II and, and this of course has uh, a profound effect on all of the artists in America. So when you look at the work of, of, of Georgia O'Keeffe, I, I always feel like once we kind of get to this period that there's more of a somber stroke that kind of comes into her work. Uh, the Grey Hills from 1941, again looking at some of the regional landscape that she would see in Arizona, uh, Red Hills and Bones, again, uh, this wonderful kind of shape that you actually get from the landscape there, and, and a lot of this has to do with the very, very dry nature of, of the desert and the fact that you also have uh, this eroding kind of wind uh, that, that kind of slices into things too. So you get these kind of crannies, uh, and again, when with her putting these bones out in front, you get this relationship between the two of the the two objects and wonderful things. Uh, Black Hills with Cedar, 1941. Uh, we have her actually traveling to a location uh, known as the Black Place quite frequently around this time and, and from my understanding this is a little bit off of the beaten path and, and uh, she w she did this entire series of work kind of around uh, this place that she called the Black Place that she had some type of personal significance with and, and again when you look at the landscape uh, it's kind of a, a reminder of that kind of filling in uh, uh, the object or, or a little bit off the beaten path of, of uh, what she was painting. We also have a series of Kachina dolls that she painted from the from the time and again we have local uh, Native American tribes in the area and, and uh, again uh, from her biography we know that she kind of would go to the the you know the gatherings and th things like that that she was kind of active in the local community uh, uh, in New Mexico in in, uh, in particular the area that she lived and again these are wonderful kind of refresh refreshing side notes to uh, her normal vocabulary of painting uh, and again I love that little blue face on on the one on the right uh, in particular.
What becomes interesting with these is how she creates the same kind of uh, volumes as she did with the previous uh, you know, objects such as flowers. Uh, this is uh, kind of two views of, of, a, of the same kind of object, if you will, this head with a broken pot, and this is always kind of a strange object uh, association for, for several reasons. One, uh, it's a human skull and, and we haven't seen, uh, we've seen animal skulls, but this is kind of this inclusion of, of a direct human reference, but we also have this broken pot around the outside, which in itself kind of had as this skull-like image and, and the, a brokenness to it. We also have uh, the inclusion of a pelvis, uh, and, and this pelvis is interesting because she includes it with the natural landscape and what really becomes interesting is her focusing on uh, the holes within it and and uh, uh, one of my friends pointed this out this tremendous use of chiaroscuro that she actually does uh, even with this incredibly simplified object we still get this amazing kind of three-dimensional push and pull uh, shadow with pelvis and moon from 1943 wonderful engaging colors uh, the blue in particular and as I mentioned when you look at the this use of the pelvis bone it does become about these bone sockets uh, as much as these larger flat planes that she has but this has this kind of rhythmic folding in and out very much like a, a flower uh, uh, would in, in this kind of analysis this is actually two different pelvis paintings put side by side uh, and again it, it really is about that that space and uh, uh, that's open that leads to the sky itself. Um, if, if you're familiar with the contemporary artist James Terrell, uh, I actually see kind of a little bit of James Terrell with this, where uh, he's creating a space, or she's rather creating this space, and and what's coming through is as interesting as as the space itself. It's kind of mass manifests itself. Uh, in pelvis number four where it's just the opening and you look through the opening and you see this moon uh, off in the background uh, and again this wonderful wonderful space that she's able to create where you really do get the three-dimensional hold of the bone as you're looking through and again uh, it's 1944 so we're at kind of this culmination of, of violence over overseas as well uh, and, and, and of course it would be hard for her not to have some type of uh, this having a direct effect on her work here a transition of color and this wonderful yellow light that's kind of coming through and and again uh, uh, illuminating the pelvis and and the opening and creating this red tone that just uh, is, is is wonderful to behold and again uh, getting it's almost as if you're holding this bone all the way to to one of your eyes and and just looking through with just the bear of one eye this is the black place that I, I had mentioned earlier and again when you look at this it's uh, it's a landscape but it's it's really even abstract to a point and, and different people have seen kind of different shadowy figures within this and uh, it's it's really kind of a haunting series of paintings that she did again most of this is relying on the tonality of, of black to gray with a little bit of red and purple in occasionally but most of it is very, very kind of more somber in subject matter, and this kind of continues into 1946 with bare tree trunks with snow. Uh, uh, this use of a darker, darker tones really kind of overtaking uh, most of the painting, where most of her earlier work we kind of associate with those wonderful soft pastels that uh, uh, we would we would find with flowers. And this is always kind of an interesting painting. Uh, just for the change in subject matter. Uh, as we kind of get farther along, uh, I, as I mentioned, the sky becomes a, as much of an element as any other aspect, and this is particularly true when we look at the work towards the end of her career. Uh, when you look up in, in the southwest, the sky just seems to go on forever, and, and in many places you do get this kind of solid blue tone where uh, you, the, the sky is remaining completely cloudless, and in other areas it's like this where the clouds uh, themselves become these these islands in the sky and and this is of course above the clouds number one where you are above the clouds this is what you would see when you would look out uh, an airplane window and it's this wonderful transcendence where you almost feel like you're flying yourself uh, up above things and and 
when you look at her biography, uh, this is kind of towards the end of her painting career. Uh, she develops eye problems, and uh, eventually what happens is she loses all of her vision, uh, except for her peripheral uh, vision, and she kind of moves uh, away from painting and more towards sculpture. Uh, in 1970, the, the Whitney in New York uh, has a, a retrospective of her work, a major honor for any artist, especially one who is still alive, but her work uh, continues to influence and amaze.